Hello, historical geology enthusiast. I'm excited to be here with you again this afternoon to talk about minerals. So whether we're discussing historical geology or physical geology, the idea that the Earth's crust is made out of minerals is an important concept. And it's especially gonna be important when we start to talk in terms of things like mountain building and plate tectonics. So we'll begin by discussing um, what minerals are and how they're formed and then the specific physical properties of how to identify a mineral in today's lecture. So I wanna start by posing a question that you can think about. And that question is, what are some common uses of minerals? What are some common uses of minerals? So uh, minerals are probably something that we take for granted in our in our day-to-day -day lifestyle, but they're actually very important. So we can think in terms of the fluoride that's in our toothpaste, the salt that's at our table, um, the use of minerals in things like building materials. So pretty much anywhere where we look, if something is not synthetic or man-made, it's gonna have been mined from the earth in the form of a mineral or a rock. So it's a really big industry also in geology is the acquisition of these different types of, of minerals. We can categorize minerals into uh, bigger and different categories. And so we can think in terms of industrial minerals, chemical minerals, construction uh, materials, sand, gravel, and limestones. Um, certainly any type of metal is also considered to be a mineral. So we think in terms of gold and silvers and platinums and aluminums, which are all um, very important and fluctuate in our economy based on uh, abundance. Um, gemstones, like who doesn't want to talk about diamonds and rubies and sapphires. And then the energy that we use, especially in and around our area, comes from coal. And um, if you you're driving up 75 into Tennessee, even into um, Kentucky, you're driving through a coal seam, and that's where some of our coal comes from, even to power uh, in Rome, Georgia. So in our day-to-day -day life, we might not think about the importance of minerals, but certainly they're very important, and they're especially important to the great state of Georgia. So um, we can't take this for granted at all. Georgia has an abundance of different types of, of minerals that can support our, our local economy and has historically. So this is uh, pretty un unusual, actually. So um, in states up north like Michigan, you very rarely find this diversity and abundance of different types of, of minerals. And that largely is because of how the state of Georgia formed. So some of the abundant minerals that we find in Georgia are barite starlight, and that's a, our state mineral. Did you know that we had a state mineral? It um, is quite beautiful. It forms in the shape of a cross. Uh, quartz, and quartz is gonna be found throughout the world. Um, Jasper, garnets, if anybody's birthday is in January. You find kaolin, especially in the middle portion of our state. Uh, hematite, beryl, talc, graphite, calcite, feldspars, and different types of, of mica. So they have a variety of different types of, of uses and applications. And depending on the abundance and the depth of which they're forming in the surface would depend on if they become economically profitable to, to mine. So again, looking at our state of Georgia and well, thinking about the abundance of different types of minerals, it has to do with how our state has formed. And we'll get into this uh, pretty heavily when we start to talk about plate tectonics. But what I wanna point out on this map is that these are called different physiographic providences. So there are um, several physiographic providences within the state of Georgia, and each of those physiographic providences have a different type of topography or landscape. And so it's, that's based on how these providences are defined. They're defined by changes in landscape. So um, Rome, Georgia is in the physiographic providence called the Blue, called the Ridge and Valley. And so if, even if you consider Lavender Mountain, you can see this hummocky topography when you're up on Lavender Mountain and they could go 
down into Big Texas Valley. So it's this rolling hill type of environment that sets the stage for the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. And if we move to the eastern part of our state, we're into the Blue Ridge. So that's by University of Georgia in Athens. And that's when you truly get into some much steeper uh, topography. And then if you move um, to the west, as you're going towards Tennessee, you're up in the uh, Cumberland Plateau. If you move south, you're in a region that's called the Piedmont. And even if you drive further all the way to the coast, you're in something that's called the Coastal Plain. So each of those different physiographic regions have different types of topographies, and those topographies also have different types of um, minerals and rocks that make those foundations. So we'll come back to this and we'll, we'll really tease this out but this is a really good place to introduce that. So when we discuss a mineral, we first discuss some properties. The first property of a mineral that you can write down in your notes is that a mineral is something that is naturally occurring. A mineral is something that's naturally occurring. And you might think this is obvious, but I'm sure you've been to the mall and you've passed K jeweler and you've gone inside and you've looked at these beautiful synthetic rubies and these lab created sapphires. And so they're for sure equally as beautiful and probably if you were not a gemologist, you would not be able to tell the, the difference, but they're created in a laboratory type of scenario to mimic what we find naturally occurring in the earth's surface. So a mineral is one that's considered naturally occurring. So there's naturally occurring rubies as an example, um, but obviously like they're limited in, um, in quantity, they're limited in quality. And of course, any type that your time that you're mining something from the natural environment, it's gonna cause environmental degradation. So, um, so that's one of the reasons why these lab created synthetic minerals um, have become popular. So naturally occurring. The second is that minerals are crystalline or that they have crystallinity. And by our definition here, a crystalline substance is one that is solid and has atoms arranged in 3D repeating orderly pattern. So that must mean that, that a mineral is going to be the combination of different types of elements that we find on the periodic table. We can use salt as an example. So you're taking sodium and chloride and they're bonding together in a 3D repeating and orderly pattern to, to provide crystallinity. So they become a solid. And that ties into the third property that minerals have specific chemical composition. So you have elements that are bonded to form specific type of minerals. So we mentioned sodium chloride to produce halite, but you can think of a variety of other types of minerals that we find on the periodic table. And it all comes down to the bonding of these elements in a specific and repeating orderly pattern. The majority of, um, of Minerals are bonded covalently. So in knowing those things, we can ask a question. Are liquids considered to be crystalline? Based on our definition that we just learned of crystallinity, you would probably say no. And the reason why liquids are not considered to be crystalline is because the whole point of crystallinity is that that it becomes a, a solid. So if it's a liquid, those atoms are able to be able to move freely. Is glass considered to be crystalline? Even though it's a solid, um, if we're thinking about glass, remember that it's probably synthetic and that those atoms are then arranged randomly so that there's no sequential order. And the last question, is ice considered to be crystalline? And here, your answer is yes. Yeah, ice is considered to be crystalline. And so ice is made out of water, H2O is the chemical composition. And so you have elements that are bonded, they're naturally occurring, 
and they have become a solid because they, they are no longer in a liquid phase. So when we talk more about the specific chemical composition of a mineral, we need to then also talk about the most abundant elements that are found in the crust. So we start off with the element of oxygen. Oxygen is, um, is, has the atomic number of eight and has the atomic weight of 16 if you're looking at your periodic table. And it is the most abundant element found on the Earth's surface. So it's found at 46.6% by weight. That's followed by silica or silicon at 27.7%. And then the third most abundant is aluminum. And that's by 8.1% by weight. And so if we think about, um, about aluminum cans and how many aluminum cans we find uh, at the Earth's surface and in the state of Georgia, you know, we don't recycle those for money. We just most often than not, right, just toss them in the trash, unfortunately. Other places, um, Michigan, New York, Ohio, Illinois, have a bottle return. And so you can purchase your can for 10 cents more, and then you can return it for money. So it's a, it's a great way to recycle a mineral that we have on the earth um, and a way to reduce consumption of that. Because again, anytime you're mining something, you're causing destruction of the landscape. So oxygen, silicon, and aluminum are all found on your periodic table. Those are the three most abundant on the Earth's surface. And so when we're talking about minerals, we usually separate them into two different groups. I'm gonna pull out my whiteboard. And so for, for minerals, we divide them into, into silicates and non-silicates. Silicates and non-silicates. And so, a silicate then, um, as we talked about, losing my microphone here, um, a silicate has silica and oxygen bonded together. And so the chemical composition is SiO2. So the purest silicate has a chemical composition of SiO2. So then the majority of minerals on the earth's surface are going to be silicates, majority, the vast majority. And that's because silica oxygen are the most abundant on the earth's surface. So, so when we talk about, about different types of silicates, how they're different is because they have different elements bonded to SiO2. Now the purest silicate, SiO2, is quartz. So the chemical composition of quartz is SiO2. Write that down. The chemical composition of quartz is SiO2. So anytime that you go to an art festival, right, or if you've gone to, I don't know, um, art festivals or Six Flags and you go in the gift shop, you, you find things like amethyst, um, amethyst jewelry. Amethyst is essentially quartz, but it has an impurity that, get, that makes it the color purple. So you can find them abundantly and that's why they're really inexpensive. So, which is opposite of something like a ruby that is considered to be a precious mineral because it's, it's not found in abundance and that's why it's much more expensive. So, so quartz is the purest of, of all silicates and then you can have a variety of others. So on our chart um, that we started the class with, there was something that was called the feldspar and a feldspar has impurities, but it also has silica and oxygen on its root. So you can talk about feldspar, um, you can talk about olivine, and you'll see these in lab, feldspar, olivine, et cetera. There's, there's many more. Um, so the difference between a silicate and a non-silicate is that 
uh, non silicates are everything else. So non silicates are things that can stand alone, elements that can stand alone. So here I put a question, looking at the periodic table, what are examples of non silicate minerals? And you're thinking about sulfur and gold and copper and lead and even carbon as an example. So those are all examples of non silicates that we can find in our natural environment. So really any type of metal is considered to be um, is considered to be a silicate. Carbon is con uh, non silicate rather. Carbon is considered to be a non silicate. Sulfur, which is that bright yellow mineral that's used in fertilizer, is also considered. So, um, so it's interesting. Like if we were to talk about mining practices, when you're looking for a non silicate, you're looking to extract one specific element, which is different than a silicate, where you're looking probably to extract the entire matrix. Okay, so we have silicates and we have non-silicates, but any group of mineral is going to be identified by the same basic properties. So here we're gonna talk about the, the physical properties that are used to identify a mineral. And this is what you'll be doing in laboratory. So by definition, each mineral has specific characteristics that allow them to be identified from one another. So if you're a geologist and you're out in the field, you're going to be trying to um, determine which minerals that you're looking at. So the first thing that we like to talk about is color. And uh, we'll do this in laboratory and it seems obvious, right? So sulfur is always gonna be yellow in color. So sulfur is a mineral that's very easily identi identifiable by just that one characteristic. And of course, sulfur smells, right? So if you burn it, it smells like um, rotten eggs. So um, color is a good place to start with, but when we consider something like quartz, so here's a beautiful piece of quartz that I have in my yoga room. Um, uh, quartz can come in a variety of different colors, like I've already said. So amethyst is purple and it's a variety of quartz. Fluorite is, um, is green in color and it's a variety of quartz. So, and then you can have rose quartz. So you can have rose quartz that shows up as a, a pink color. So it's not always the best indicator because there can be great variability in, in that, but it's a good place to start. The second is called streak. And so what you'll be doing in lab is you'll have a ceramic plate and you'll have your mineral and you'll scratch it on that ceramic plate and you're looking at the color of the streak. And to be honest, I've never seen a geologist do this ever in the field, but it's one thing that we, that we like to talk about. Um, usually what happens either your streak is colorless or your streak is the same color of your sample. So if you have a yellow piece of sulfur and you, and you, you scrape it across the ceramic plate that's white, you'll see a yellow residue. Um, magnetite is the only mineral where there's usually a difference. So magnetite is going to be silver in color. And when you streak it, it leaves a, um, a red residue. So it's something that we like to talk about in the world of geology as a means of identifying. The next is luster. And luster, luster, um, luster has to do with the reflectivity of light off of the surface of a mineral. So we can talk about earthy luster, or we can talk about metallic luster, or we can talk about glassy luster. So go ahead and write those down. These are categories of luster. And luster, again, is the way light reflects off of the surface of a mineral. So you can have three categories, earthy, metallic, and glassy. Um, 
something that would be considered earthy would be like kaolinite, um, um, which is chalk, essentially. A fancy word for chalk is kaolinite, where it just has a very dull and does not reflect any light off the surface. Quartz, on the other hand, would be considered to be glassy because it re reflects light off of the surface. And then something that is metallic is either going to be gold or going to be silver. So pyrite or fool's gold that's found commonly in Dahlonega, Georgia, is considered metallic because it's gold in color. And then galena or graphite, is, which is silver, is going to also be considered uh, a metallic luster. So color, streak, luster, you can do those pretty quickly. The next thing on deck is thinking in terms of how hard the mineral is to break down. And the fella by the name of Mose came up with this fantastic method of determining hardness. So on your screen, you'll see Mose hardness scale and it's ranked from one to 10, where one is the softest and 10 is the hardest. So you'll notice that diamonds are one of the hardest minerals on the planet, right? And that's one of the reasons why we use them in engagement rings, you know, like hard and everlasting love, blah, 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 right? So um, one is talc and talc is your baby powder. And so talc is something that's natural and they go ahead and add fragrance to it. I don't know if you knew that, but it's, it's actually a natural substance and they break it down and then they add um, scent to it. And so it's, it's very soft and you'll see that in the laboratory. So the idea is it's giving you a foundation to rank the hardness of minerals on a scale from one to 10. You'll notice that, um, that quartz has a hardness of seven and the vast majority of minerals on the planet are gonna be between five and seven. So if they have a hardness um, that's greater than five, they will be able to scratch glass. So anything that has a hardness greater than appetite is able to scratch glass. And so that's your big test. Um, if you have an engagement ring and you wanna figure out if it's a diamond or if it's a cubic zirconian, <laughs> you can take it and scratch it. And if it doesn't scratch glass, it's probably fake. There you go. That's your tip for today. Don't think I didn't try mine on a piece of glass. For sure I did. And my husband knew he would be busted. So he passed the test. Now, um, yeah, I'm in, guess what? You're not going to see any diamonds in lab. So sorry about your luck for that one. So most of the um, minerals on the planet are going to have a hardness between five and seven and be able to scratch glass. If it is um, less than a four, if it's greater than a four, it should be able to scratch a copper penny. So if it has a hardness of between four and five, it should be able to scratch a penny. And if it has a hardness of two or less, it should be able to, you should be able to scratch the mineral with your fingernail. So gypsum and talc are very, very soft. So it's actually a really good, um, a really good indicator. And what you'll notice in, in lab is that you're gonna look at a variety of different types of minerals that are clear. So uh, you're gonna look at calcite, you're gonna look at different types of quartz, and you're gonna look at halite. And so one of the key things to differentiate quartz from calcite and halite is that quartz is going to be much softer. So then you have to determine the difference between calcite and halite, which look very similar. Calcite is going to react to acid. So it's, it's going to dissolve under the presence of HCl. And halite, of course, if you wanted to taste the sample, it would taste salty. So tying into the idea of hardness, we can ask the question, what does the number two mean on your pencil? And I bet you never thought of it, um, but it has to do with the hardness of that graphite. So my, my artist in the audience probably um, buy a variety of different type of hardnesses in their granite, um, their graphite pencils, because they can, they can range in their softness and their ability to, to smudge, essentially. 
color, streak, luster, hardness. Now the next one is called cleavage. And this has to do with how a mineral will naturally break. So if you have a, a big piece of quartz and you throw it on the ground, the question is how is it naturally gonna shatter? So um, of all the, the, of all, I had to get my eraser, of all the physical properties, cleavage is probably the hardest one to define. Okay, so cleavage again is the natural breaking point of, the, of a mineral. And when we talk about cleavage, we determine it in different categories. We have zero, one, two, or three planes of cleavage. And again, you're thinking about the natural ability of something to break. And so you're considering an X plane, a Y plane, and a Z plane. Okay, going back to some mathematical properties there. So is it breaking in the X? Is it breaking in the X and Y? Or is it breaking in the X, Y, and Z plane? So let's start with one plane of cleavage. If something has one plane of cleavage, it's gonna be flat. It's gonna be completely flat. So it's gonna break in one direction. And examples of this are gonna be muscovite. Uh, we can commonly find muscovite in the state of Georgia. So if you cruise up 53, as if you're going to Tennessee, you can find uh, muscovite outcrops. Um, also, it weathers out of Stone Mountain granite. So if you've ever been up to the top of Stone Mountain and you found sand and it's glittery, um, it's muscovite. And also, um, if you're wearing makeup or highlighter, it's usually uh, muscovite or glitter. It's usually muscovite that's mixed in to give us that, that shimmer, that glow. So it's a natural product. Um, two, no, let's go to three. Three planes of cleavage is going to be something that's cubic. Something that's cubic. So these break in a perfect cube. So th something that's cubic is going to break in a perfect cube. So halite calcite and galena are examples of a mineral that if you break it, it breaks in a perfect cube. If it has no planes of cleavage, it's gonna be considered irregular, irregular. So even though sometimes when we look at quartz, you can find it in these beautiful prisms, what you'll notice is that if you compare those prisms, they're completely different. So the shape and the angle of which they are forming are not the same, they're completely different. So these are considered to be irregular. And you don't always find quartz in the form of a prison. Sometimes you can find it just in a, a solid form. So zero is irregular. Um, quartz, which is the most abundant mineral on the surface of the earth, is irregular. One is going to be completely flat, like muscovite or biotite. Three planes is going to be cubic, like calcite, halite, and galena. And then two is called stair step. And that means it breaks on an X and a Y. And the truth is, that stair step or two planes of cleavage is very common. So feldspars uh, is an example and feldspar always breaks in two planes of cleavage. It's pretty hard to identify, honestly. Um, if you don't have a trained eye, it took me a long time to, to be able to identify minerals that have cleavage of two planes. But um, if you're ever on an exam and you're in doubt, and you know it's not 
one plane and you know it's not cubic, then it's probably two, two planes of cleavage. It's probably stair step because it is quite, quite common. Here are just some um, photographs that we can go through since we're not dealing with hand samples. Um, this is an example of quartz. So I had a piece here, two pieces here. And so down at the bottom um, is kind of like the, the most common form where it's not formed in prisms, but it has, both of these are considered to have irregular shapes. Uh, here's an example of biotite. Um, the difference between biotite and muscovite is biotite is black in color and muscovite is gold in color. But, there, but you can see from this picture how that mineral is completely flat. And so it just, um, it breaks off in, in flakes. Uh, here is an example of hornblende and hornblende has two planes of cleavage. And this is a really good diagram up on the screen where you can see one direction of cleavage, two directions of cleavage, which is also called prismatic and three planes of cleavage where it's called cubic. So you can look at that two plane of cleavage, which is hornblende, if you look at close to the picture, where you can see these like little stair steps that begin to, that begin to form, which is different than something that's a cube. And here is a piece of halite, a natural form of salt, and it is a perfect cube. So we talk about minerals first because minerals are considered to be the building blocks of rocks. So our first lab is looking at minerals. Our second lab will start to think about um, how those minerals combine to form different types of, of rocks. And what you may be aware is that we can talk in terms of a rock cycle where you have igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Um, rocks, but we'll get there in sequential labs. So before we do that, my question is, why do we study rocks in the first place? Kind of like who cares really about studying rocks and what information can we gain by studying rocks? And this is probably what you're thinking, honestly, at a one-on-one level, and I don't blame you. Um, but truly, Rocks is, is a tool that we use as a geologist that gives us a story. So we can learn so much about past environments by just looking at how these rocks became to solidify as they originate from magma, how they erode at the earth's surface, and then how they change through heat and pressure over geologic time, over 4.6 billion years. So it's a fantastic tool that we can use to reconstruct the past environment. So if you can imagine, um, I'm sure you've taken landscape hikes, whether that's uh, up to the House of Dreams or other national parks throughout the United States, and you've looked at these rocks and they're beautiful. You might be able to agree that you're looking at landscapes that are beautiful, but hopefully after we begin to truly study these different rock types, you'll understand and appreciate them more because they're gonna tell you something about the formation and what has happened on the surface of the earth. Um, so we mentioned that we can use these rocks to recreate past environments. And then our next question of course is, why do we care about past environments? Why do we care so much about, about past environments? And remembering from um, previous lectures, the present is the key to the past, but the past is also a key to the present. So if we want to learn truly, like something about how the climate is cha cha changing, um, using 100 years of data to tell us about weather isn't enough if we want to understand climate, because climate is looking at changes on a more drastic and usually a larger scale. So it gives us um, interesting clues. And also even for things like natural disasters, like earthquakes and volcanic activity and landslides, like we can learn so much more by understanding 
the mechanisms and what has happened in the past. So that's one of the reasons why I get so excited about rocks and the rock cycle. And this will be just a precursor into what's to come. This is our rock cycle. And so, as we said, we like to separate rocks into three different groups. Rocks are made of minerals. So that's why we've started at the foundation of describing minerals. Um, there's three major groups. So you have igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. And we call it a, a rock cycle, but the true start of that rock cycle is going to be the magma that comes up from the outer core. So you have the inner core that's solid, and then you have the outer core that's liquid, and that liquid is called magma. And that'll eventually work its way up to the, up to the surface through a process that's called solidification. So you have igneous rocks, and then you can break down those igneous rocks into sediment, and then that sediment can be lithified or compacted to become a sedimentary rock. And then if you have that sedimentary rock or the igneous rock at the surface and you add heat and you add pressure, it changes into a metamorphic rock. Fascinating, huh? And if you have, if you have a metamorphic rock at the surface and you break it down into a piece of the sediment, you can reform a sedimentary type of rock. And if you have a sedimentary rock and you add too much heat, it can melt, turn to magma, and then become an igneous rock. So the idea is that the rock cycle is in fact cyclical. Um, so I think I will stop here for this afternoon. You've been a wonderful audience and I will see you soon for another exciting episode. Have a great day.